Okay, so we're continuing on in our first unit here, looking at metaphysics and epistemology. So far we've looked at Plato, we've looked at Descartes, we've looked at Locke. What have these think thinkers been investigating? What are we looking at in this unit? Somebody give me a general idea or take a shot at it. What are some of the things we've been talking about? In questioning everything. Questioning everything, yeah, that's true. Although we saw in Descartes, right, he was trying to get past that skepticism, right? He was trying to basically rebuild his foundations for knowledge and human knowledge moving forward. We've thrown around a few jargony words. Dualism, rationalism, empiricism. What are these things about? Yeah. Isn't empiri empiricism about uh, like after an event, and then is it rationalism is the one that's uh, before an event, and there's like word for like a posterior, not posterior. <laughs> yeah, thing. it's got that word in it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, so we've been looking at various positions on not only what the universe is made up of, but also how we know things. And like you said, those two positions of empiricism and rationalism have to do with certain ways of how we obtain knowledge of the world, right? So we've been talking about knowledge. We've been talking about logic and reason, experience, right? We've been talking about substances, right? This is the word that Descartes used to try to describe what things in the universe are made of, right? He put forth a dualistic position, which argues that basically everything in the universe is made up of one or two substances. There's physical stuff, matter, like atoms, like coffee cups and computers, and then there are minds, right? Mental things, ideas, perceptions. Well, we're continuing on that kind of track today, except we're going to be looking at a thinker who is going to try to take empiricism to its logical conclusion today. One of the first things that Descartes doubted in his piece were the senses, right? He's like, look, the senses deceive us sometimes. Sometimes we think we feel a vibration in our pocket and we have a notification and we don't really have one, right? Sometimes we think we feel something behind us, right? And then we turn around and there's nothing there. So he discounted the senses. He thought that the senses were not a reliable way for us to, to obtain knowledge of the world. Rather, it's reason. It's reason that we should be relying on, right? And this position was known as rationalism. Well, what did Locke say? What was Locke's take on that whole line of argument? What did we look at on Monday? Yeah. Right, exactly. He had read Descartes writings and he was like, eh, you know, Descartes, you make some interesting points here. But there are certain things that reason can't get us to, right? There are certain things that we can only learn about the world through experience, such as what a piece of chalk tastes like, right? Or what an amazing wind feels like on the field, right? These things we can't reason ourselves towards. We need to experience certain things in order to obtain knowledge of them. So he hung his hat on empiricism, this idea that primarily the way that we obtain knowledge of the world around us is through our senses, our sense of hearing, sight, smell, taste, and touch through experience. It's 
through experience with things out there in the world that we obtain knowledge of them. And Locke spends a great deal of time breaking this down, talking about the different ideas that we have, right? what their sources are, and what they're like. How different things strike us as we move throughout the world. Well, George Barclay is also going to be an empiricist like Locke, but he's going to end up drawing some very strange conclusions as the result of taking this view seriously. As we'll see, he doesn't think Locke took it far enough. And the result of that for Barclay's philosophy is going to be very strange. But before we get there, let me just give you an overview of who this person is and why he matters. George Barclay was an Irish bishop in the Catholic Church. He was a philosopher. He was a writer. And we might characterize him as a romantic thinker. Do you remember in one of the first classes we talked about different periods in European history? We talked about, you know, the Middle Ages, and we talked about... Uh, the Enlightenment and the Renaissance and all of that. Well, during the time of the Enlightenment, there was also what you might call a countercultural movement that was also occurring. What was the Enlightenment focused on? What did I tell you people in the Enlightenment were doing in their writings? How, they, how were they thinking? Right, exactly. When we talked about the Enlightenment, we made a point to emphasize reason. During this time, thinkers were concerned with using reason to figure out answers to human problems, right? And really leaning into reason and leaning into the scientific method to make more sense of the world around them. This is why during this time we saw an explosion of, of knowledge in the technical fields, and the scientific fields, and the natural sciences. Well, there are people living during this time who saw some merit in doing this, but they also saw the weaknesses, the flaws of just relying on reason and logical thinking all the time. These were the romanticists, okay? So while reason was having its heyday, we might say during the 17th to 18th centuries, there was also another group during this time who was looking at what the Enlightenment thinkers were doing and they were like, mm, we think you got it wrong there, buds. It's not reason that really should be prioritized in human life. We shouldn't hang our hats totally on that, but it's passion, it's feeling that we should be focused on. That's what really matters. That's what really gives life its meaning, right? Who cares if you can think about stuff logically all day? What matters is how you feel. Poetry and love and the arts. The sciences, that's a fun thing to do in your off time, but the stuff of human life has to do with passion and feeling, okay? And we can characterize George Barclay as kind of being in this camp, a romantic thinker. He's one of the first romantic thinkers who is critical of Enlightenment thinkers and what people in the Enlightenment were doing and how they were trying to expand the bounds of human knowledge. And obviously this debate still persists today, right? In different ways, in different areas of human life. I'm sure you all have that really logical, scientific, analytical friend who's like, you gotta think rationally, bro, right? 
that's how you ought to live your life. And I'm sure you might be the other person or have a friend who's like, no, it's about feeling and love and, you know, passion and, ugh, right? Very artsy fartsy person. So these ideas are still being debated today, these dispositions, these ways of life. During this Enlightenment period, one of the things that these romantic thinkers were fighting against, rebelling against, was this idea that started to become popular as a result of the natural sciences and Newton's discoveries, which we might call mechanistic materialism. Okay? George Berkeley was one of the thinkers who was writing against this idea. If you had a guess, what do you think this view of mechanistic materialism is or says? Any idea? It's very sciencey sounding. It is sciencey. Yeah, it has something to do with, yeah, mechanical stuff. Yeah. Got anything else to add? Well, the, the romantic thinkers definitely would have been a little bit against the Industrial Revolution for sure. But that's not what this view is specifically about. Yeah? Is it like thinking that like the brain, there's in a separate mind, and it's just all like the mechanisms of the mind that make us stop? It's, ex it's related to that, exactly. This view of mechanistic materialism is what we might call the scientific view of the world, if we want to oversimplify this idea that everything in the universe, according how your brain works, according how your feelings operate, everything, atoms, molecules, everything operates according to certain natural laws, and that really the universe is kind of like one big large machine operating according to certain rules and principles. That's the mechanistic part, right? Things are just kind of doing their thing, operating according to natural laws. There's nothing really special going on. The materialism part is all this stuff that you see around you, it's just matter and energy at the end of the day. There's nothing special about the mind. The mind is not something separate or distinct from what a table is or what a shirt is. So we might say this is an example of a monistic theory which argues that one substance makes up everything in the universe this substance happens to be physical it's matter so this view lies in direct contrast to Descartes dualism right which said that ah, people there are minds that exist and then there's material things and these things are distinct and you can't reduce them to one another no, this view is going to say everything that's hap going on in your mind right now, your perceptions, your feelings, your dreams, you can explain all of that stuff just through physical explanations of how neurons are firing, how neurotransmitters work, the different chemical reactions in your brain, etc. Well, Berkeley didn't like this idea, okay? So he disagreed with it, obviously, and he wrote against it this view which was becoming popular due to science having its heyday during the Enlightenment and resulting in the scientific revolution. We can say that this view kind of arose out of Newtonian science, or at least it was becoming popular on account of what Newton was doing during this time period as well. Another view that was becoming popular was a particular conception of God. Even though people were starting to lean into reason and science and the scientific method, the vast majority of the people who in fact were engaging in scientific research and pushing science forward, at least in Europe, were Christians. They still believed in God to some extent, but as a result of 
what was happening during this time and the discoveries that they were making, their idea of God gradually changed. This view started to become popular that was known as the Grand Watchmaker view of God. Does anybody know what this view is? Have you heard of it before? According to this theory, God is like a supreme watchmaker, and the universe is like a watch. And at the beginning of time, God set the conditions of the universe and created it, and wound up the watch, and now he's just watching it play out. He's not intervening in his creation at all. He's just letting things go their own way, and he's watching it from above. This was a conception of God that was becoming popular at the time. George Barclay was not a fan of this view either. He didn't think God was really like this. He didn't like this idea that God just kind of created the universe and set it and forget it. But this was a view that a lot of Christian scientists at this time started to believe in. So, part of what Barclay is doing in this piece is he's writing against these ideas that were becoming popular. He is writing against what Locke has to say that we looked at on Monday. Although he's going to agree with some of what Locke says, what he's going to be doing in this piece, as I've said a few times now, is he's going to take this view of empiricism to its logical conclusion. Because he is an empiricist like Locke, but that's going to lead him in a very different direction compared to what Locke concluded due to his philosophy. He's also going to argue against Locke's tabula rasa view of humanity. Does anybody remember what that view is? Yeah. Exactly. And what does that mean? Right. Remember Locke put forth this view that humans are born as blank slates. They get all of their ideas and concepts from their experiences in the world. In other words, they're not born with any ideas or conceptions. Barclay doesn't think that's true. He's going to be arguing against that in this essay. And he's going to be arguing against one key, another key feature of Locke's philosophy, as we'll see. What was the picture that I offered you when I told you this is how Locke sees the world? I referred to it as this is the commonsensical view of our relationship to reality. Does anybody remember that? If it helps, think about where Locke thinks our ideas come from. Remember our whole discussion about primary and secondary qualities and all this stuff? It's such a basic commonsensical view, you wouldn't even think to utter it because it's just like we all presume it. Right, right. What were you going to say, Jade? The material world is real. Right, exactly. This idea that, look, there's us as humans, you know, and we have a certain brain or a certain mind, and we're perceiving the world, and then there are objects out there, like tables and chairs that are separate from us, 
And these objects cause us to have certain ideas. Remember? This is the commonsensical view that we kind of all have of reality, right? Look, there are tables and chairs and trash cans and chalkboards, and those things exist independently of us. And were we all to die tonight, all that shit would still be there, right? It wouldn't disappear with us because it has its own independent existence, right? We called this the commonsensical view. Well, Barclay is going to be doing something strange and fascinating in this piece. He's going to argue against this commonsensical view, against this commonsensical picture of reality that we kind of all take for granted. Because as we'll see, Barclay thinks if we really think empiricism is true, if we take exactly what our experience gives us and we rely on that, not only can we not prove that material objects exist out there, outside of us, but we can't even prove that matter exists. Interesting. Right? Okay. Any questions so far? Y'all still following along? To just repeat myself. Barclay's rejection of this commonsensical picture of reality is going to fall out of him taking empiricism to its logical conclusion. At least that's what he thinks he's doing. Because he agrees with Locke that we obtain knowledge of the world around us through experience. But he's going to say, to think that there are objects out there existing outside of us, independently of us, is making a logical leap that is unfounded, that we can't prove. OK. Y'all ready to get into his line of argument for this? His crazy view? He's going to put forth an even crazier view in a little bit. I think you'll like it. It's really weird. OK. One of the things that you can understand this piece is doing is basically being a big response to Locke. Okay, One of the reasons why Barclay wrote this essay is because, well, like, all, uh, like a good educated man during his time that was interested in philosophy, he was reading what other philosophers were writing. right? And so he wrote what Locke had written. And though he agreed with parts of it, he thought that Locke was making a bunch of logical leaps and a bunch of unfounded claims. One of the first things we see him doing in this piece is attacking Locke's distinction between primary and secondary qualities. And I know this looks like Berkeley, like Berkeley, California, but it's pronounced Barkley because he's an Irish guy, OK? Barclay argues that we have no firm basis for thinking that there are such things as primary and secondary qualities as Locke defines them.
Does anybody remember how Locke defined primary and secondary qualities? What does your note say? Yeah. Right. Right. Remember Locke's view of reality. There are objects out there, outside of us. They have certain properties. And the way that those objects are, the properties that they have, cause us to have certain ideas about what the objects are like. First, there are primary qualities. These are properties or qualities inherent in the object itself, part of the object itself. So for example, Locke was arguing, the reason why we all see this table as rectangular is because it's fucking rectangular. Okay, that's the way it is. Like that is its objective shape. Doesn't depend on whether you're in Moscow in the United States, objectively, this has a rectangular shape, okay? Objectively, this has a cylindrical shape, right? The piece of chalk. And it's the same thing for things like motion, solidity. What were some other properties he thought were primary? Yes. Extension, whether or not it has volume, right? All of these things, Locke argued, doesn't, they don't depend on us, right? That this table has volume is just a fact about the table. It's a feature of the table itself, right? Regardless of whether we're in this room to perceive it or not. So there are primary qualities that are part of the objects themselves, and then there are secondary qualities. Not part of the objects themselves, based in part, Locke thinks, on the primary qualities an object has, but things like color and sound and taste that, again, are not in the object itself, but nevertheless cause us to have certain ideas about the object, right? And one of the reasons why Locke makes this distinction in the first place is because he thinks this helps explain our differences in perception, right? Well, Berkeley says, y'all should think about this a little bit more, okay? If you think about this hard, you'll realize that this distinction between primary and secondary qualities is dumb. We're making a logical leap by doing that. Why? Berkeley says all qualities are relative to the perceiver. <clears throat> that is, we don't have any objective basis for thinking. There are features of the objects themselves, and then there are these other things that we disagree about. I said before that according to Locke, this table is rectangular, right? What if, what if you look at it like that? Does that look rectangular to you? No. Or imagine a piece of paper, right? Look, Locke is going to say, objectively, this is rectangular. What if I do that? When I flip it like that, does it look rectangular to you? No, so what we can discern about objects is relative to where we're standing, how our mind is working. It's relative to the person seeing it. And it's the same thing with motion, right? Locke says whether an object is in motion or not is objective. It doesn't depend on the perceiver, right? Well, we know from our best scientific theories Einsteinian relativity that that's not true, right? It depends on your frame of reference. 
if this coffee cup is moving like this and you're walking alongside it, is it going to look like it's moving to you? No. Similarly, if you happen to be going at the speed of light, everything else would look motionless to you, even if it was moving from another frame of reference. Right? So Barclay says, what objects look like to us, it depends on where we're standing, how our mind is working, perhaps our mood, all of these different things. Our perceptions of objects depend on how we are perceiving them. We can't say that there are objectively some features about these objects. All we have access to are our own perceptions of things. Right? To say that something is in itself a certain way is going beyond our perceptions of them, which we can't do. Right? If we actually took our experiences and our perceptions seriously, we wouldn't be making all these claims about what things were like in themselves. We would just rely on what we're experiencing right in front of us. Right? So one way of explaining this or cashing this out is Barclay is implying we cannot stand outside of our own mind and ascertain reality. We're stuck having the perceptions and point of view that we have right now, right? In another philosophical, jargony way of saying it, there is no view from nowhere. When we are looking out at people and things in reality, we're doing so from a u particular unique standpoint. And we can't step outside of our own standpoint, right? You're stuck in here. You can't get outside of your own mind and objectively ascertain the nature of things, right? All you have access to is what your mind is giving you right now. All of your perceptions of reality are being filtered through this thing we call a consciousness, and that is how we view the world. That's how it works. So we cannot stand outside of our own minds and ascertain reality objectively. We're kind of stuck in the standpoint, in the perspective that we are currently in, right? Or rather, I should say, the only thing that we can base our knowledge of the universe on is our own perceptions. That is, again, all we can have access to is our perception of things. We talk as if we know what things are really like in themselves, out there, independent of our perception. But how the hell could we know any of that? Right? We say things like, there are objects existing independently of us. This is objectively motionless. This is objectively you know, rectangular. But how can we say any of that justifiably? Berkeley is saying we can't. All we have access to are our perceptions. You see what I'm saying? So we don't have any justifiable reason to think there is such a distinction between primary and secondary qualities. Really, whenever we look at an object, it's all this. It's all secondary. We can't say what an object is like objectively independent of our perceptions of it. Because the way we see the world, the way we understand it, is through our perceptions. To help motivate this a little bit, let me run a thought experiment by you. This is a famous one that, that Barclay puts forth. Remember, Locke's view of reality is there's us, and then there are things outside of us that have their own independent existences. And we can know what those things are like. Right? Maybe if we do science, if we you know compare our experiences, all this stuff. 
I want you to close your eyes for a second. Everybody close your eyes. Okay, got them closed? Okay. Imagine a tree. Imagine a tree that nobody else is looking at, okay? Imagine a tree and there's nobody else around. Okay, open your eyes. Will somebody come and draw what they imagined on the board? What did you see in your mind's eye? I'll, I'll draw what I saw. Here, you can come up too, yeah. This is what I saw, okay? That's what I saw. That was crazy. Did you see something different? Yeah, what did you see? Mine was big. Mine was like this. Like this. Oh, sick. Nice trunk action. Yeah, it was a little big trunk. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Did anybody see anything differently? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Did anybody see the tree from like the bird's eye view? Just like looking down at it? Did anybody see the tree? You know, maybe it was like on a hill. Maybe it was in the Antarctic. You, I don't know. What did you see? I saw a pine tree. You saw a pine tree. Okay, so it was more like it was more like this. Something like that. I saw a tree that looked like the one from Big Fish. The one from the Big Fish like the poster. That's a good movie. So it was kind of brambly? Yeah. Okay. Ooh, Great video game by the way. It's on Game Pass right now, Bramble. Our commonsensical view of reality tells us there are objects out there. We can know what they are like in and of themselves. But what does our experience tell us? What does this little thought experiment show us? It shows us we cannot imagine or conceive or think about anything that is not being perceived. When you try to imagine a tree unperceived, what are you doing? You're perceiving it. You're sneaking in a perceiver, right? That's kind of weird. So what does that say? What that says is to think that there are objects existing out there independently of us, independent of our perception, is a logical leap. Because when we conceive of such a state of affairs or we imagine it, we're still perceiving it. We're still perceiving those things. So Barclay thinks this famous tree thought experiment shows somehow that the existence of a thing and our perception of that thing are intimately connected in a strange way. Barclay is the one who comes up with the question, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around to hear it, does it make a sound? And he says, no, it doesn't make a sound because there's nobody around to hear it. We can't prove that it makes a sound, at least, because there's nobody there to figure out if it makes a sound or not, right? Barclay thinks this thought experiment shows we cannot imagine or conceive of something unperceived. Why? Well, if we try to imagine something unperceived or think of something independent of our perception, we're sneaking in a perceiver, right? Because by imagining that or thinking of that, you are perceiving that state of affairs. We sneak in a perceiver if we try to do it. We cannot 
think of or imagine something unperceived. Just try it again. Try to think of a star unperceived or a coffee mug unperceived. By thinking of it, by imagining it, you're perceiving it. Okay? So, what we can say about the existence of something relies intimately on our perception of it. Here is what he says. This is in section three. That neither our thoughts, nor passions, nor ideas formed by the imagination exist without the mind is what everybody will allow. So, thoughts, ideas, things that we imagine, they depend for their existence on the mind. You can't have thoughts or ideas without a mind. Okay? And it seems no less evident that the various sensations or ideas imprinted on us, however blended or combined together, cannot exist otherwise than in a mind perceiving them. I think an intuitive knowledge may be obtained of this by anyone that shall attend to what is meant by the term exist. The table I write on, I say, exists when I see it and feel it. And if I were out of my study, I should say it existed, meaning thereby that if I was in my study, I might perceive it. Or that some other spirit actually does perceive it. There was an odor. That is, it was smelled. There was a sound. That is to say, it was heard. A color or figure, and it was perceived by sight or touch. This is all that I can understand by these and the like expressions. For as to what is said of the absolute existence or the independent existence of something, seems perfectly unintelligible. Their essay is percipi, nor is it possible that they should have any existence outside of the minds or thinking things which perceive them. This is a Latin phrase. Barclay says, perhaps in the same uh, revelatory way that Descartes uttered his famous phrase. He says, their essay est percipi. These modern philosophers love their Latin phrases. What does this mean? To be is to be perceived. Or to exist is to be perceived. We can only talk about the existence of something or think about it as long as we're perceiving it. Somehow, the existence of a thing and the perception of that thing are inseparable. He continues, it is indeed an opinion strangely prevailing amongst people that houses, mountains, rivers, and in a world all sensible objects have an existence, natural or real, or real, distinct from their being perceived by a mind. But with how great an assurance and acquiescence soever this principle may be entertained in the world, yet whoever shall find in his heart to call it in question may, if I mistake not, perceive it to be a manifest contradiction. For what are the forementioned objects? Rivers, mountains, river, uh, trees, houses. But the things that we perceive by sense. And what do we perceive besides our own ideas or sensations? And is it not plainly repugnant that any of these or any combination of them should exist unperceived? Here's what he's saying. When we're looking out at the world around us, when we're making claims about what exists, we're doing that on the basis of our perceptions. All we have access to is our perceptions of things. 
what you might call sensations or ideas or concepts. So we can know for sure that ideas, concepts, perceptions, they exist, right? Because they're happening to us and we're mulling them over and we're considering them and we're questioning them. To say that there are objects out there causing us to have those things is a logical leap. We can't prove that there are any objects outside of our own mind because all we grapple with are our own perceptions. And who knows where the hell they're coming from? Maybe they're being beamed into you by an alien and you just think there are tables and chairs around you, right? Maybe you're really wired into the matrix like Neo and you think you're in Pittsburgh right now, but maybe you're just in a pod somewhere, right? All you have access to are your perceptions. This is what Barclay is getting at. If we take empiricism seriously, this is what we find. We cannot prove the existence of objects out there in the world. We say that all of the stuff around us is made of this thing called matter, right? Like look, this table is made of matter, right? The notebook is made of matter. This is what science tells us, right? Tell me, what is matter? Have you ever tasted matter? Have you ever seen matter? No, right? What the fuck is even that thing? What is matter? Barclay is going to say this is just a mental <clears throat> abstraction that we then impose on the world. We can't prove that there is this underlying substance that makes up everything that we can't like we can't even see or touch it, right? All we can do is engage with our perceptions, right? Perception of hardness, ooh, perception of smoothness perception of it's hot in this fucking room. It's weird, right? This idea that there are objects existing independently of us. Barclay says, you can't prove that. That's a logical leap. Yeah. That, that's what science tells us, right? So then, but have you ever experienced it? I mean, <laughs> wouldn't every experience we have do with matter if everything is made of it? Yeah, but I'm talking about like matter in and of itself. Yeah, that, that right? was just like, it was just contradictory. Like, if stuff is actually well, made of matter, then yeah, we're interacting with it, right? But how can we prove that anything is made of matter? Right? right? That's, that's the issue, that's the crux, right? Like, for example, I know what the perception of sweetness is, right? Mmm, nice, nutty pumpkin uh, coffee from Dunkin', or whatever it is. I taste sweet, I taste nutty, right? I have experience with that. Can any of us say, yeah, you know, I was dealing with some matter last night in my room, you know, that one, that thing that makes up everything else, like in its pure form, I was handling it, you know? Barclay's going to say, no, nobody can do that. This thing we call matter is just an abstraction, bro. It's this weird scientific abstraction that we've come up with to try to make sense of the world, but it's a logical leap. Continuing on, and this is the last thing I'll read. If we thoroughly examine this tenet, it will perhaps be found at bottom to depend on the doctrine of abstract ideas. 
For can there be a nicer strain of abstraction than to distinguish the existence of sensible objects from their being perceived, so as to conceive of them existing unperceived? Light and colors, heat and cold, extension and figures, in a, wor in a word, the things we see and feel, they are nothing but sensations, notions, ideas, or impressions on the sense. Is it possible to separate even in thought any of these things from perception? For my part, I might as easily divide a thing from itself. That is, it doesn't make sense. So he's going to say these things that we call objects, they're just bundles of perceptions or bundles of ideas. We can't say that there are these things independently existing outside of us with objective properties. All we can say about them is that the things that we experience are a bundle of different perceptions and ideas. And all of this leads Berkeley to put forth a radical metaphysical view. A view that we might call idealism or immaterialism. This lies in direct contrast to Descartes' view and what we might call the scientific view of the universe. Barclay thinks, actually, what empiricism shows us, if we take it seriously, is the only things that exist in the universe are minds and ideas. That's it. We can't prove the existence of objects outside of our own minds. We can't prove that those objects are physical or material, made of matter. He, so he concludes, the only things that exist are minds and ideas. That's it. What time does this class get out? 11.10. OK, perfect. So what do you think about this view? Well, or maybe what do you think about his chain of argument up until this point? Is he making sense? Does anybody here think we can prove the existence of objects outside of our own minds? Or do you agree with Barclay on that? Yes? I don't necessarily agree. So, I mean, I do agree with you, but I'm thinking that it's not what I believe in because I'm just about. <laughs> You're like, this is going to give me an existential crisis, right? Okay, so, so you agree kind of with his line of argument. You're like, yeah, all we have access to are our perceptions, right? I just choose not to think about it. <laughs> yeah, it can be kind of scary, right? My uh, advisor in college, he used to teach this stuff, okay? He was a philosophy professor. He taught this to a class one time, and a week later, one of his students was like, I'm totally convinced I'm dropping out of school. It was nice having you as a professor, and he left. He was so captivated by this view. He thought it was correct. He's like, well, you know, none of this stuff is really physical, like material. It doesn't really have that much importance, right? So I, I'm not going to encourage you to quit. But <laughs> you can see how this line of thinking, right, might enthrall you. Right? I mean, how can you po how can we poke holes in the argument up until this point? Right? It seems pretty, pretty airtight. 
Yeah. I just kind of feel like it doesn't matter that we can't prove that things exist outside of us because we are just always going to be in this objective reality and nothing else. We should just deal with what it seems like it is. Yeah, one response is like, look, what does this matter at all? Yeah. Right? Like, for example, you probably, you've heard me say it, you may have heard your friends say it, oh my god, what if we're in a simulation, man? What if we're in an alien simulation right now? And one of the responses to that is, what would that fucking change? Right? I'm here. Right? I feel things. I do things. I see things. What does it matter? You know? I still have the job to go to. I still got to do Professor Gunner's homework. <laughs> right? Is there anybody who kind of likes this view? I'm like, ooh, it's kind of cool. Yeah? yeah? You got anything to say about it? Yeah, but I think it's like similar to what you said. Like, I find it interesting. It's like, I like it, but at the same time, I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I think it's one of those things where you can just like think about it every now and then and be like, oh. Like, like cool. Like, it's just cool, a little. Like, things don't exist. <laughs> yeah. Also, yeah. I'm going to keep living the way I'm living. Right. Because what can I change? Well, that that's an important distinction we should probably make here. I don't want you to think Barclay is saying any of this stuff is less real. He's not saying that. He's saying it's all real, right? It impacts us, right? We deal with it. We consider it. It, it, it. Things happen, right? It's real. But what he's saying is it's just not what you thought it was. It's not a material thing existing independently of you. Somehow, its existence is dependent on a mind perceiving it. But that doesn't make it any less real. It's just, it's just a different thing than you thought it was. Which, if anybody's been following along here, you should have a question. Barclay said before that the existence of a thing is somehow equivalent to its being perceived. And you remember what I said about the tree? Barclay's going to say, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around to hear it, it doesn't make a sound because nobody's around to hear it. That should have you wondering, is the stuff in my dorm room existing right now? Nobody's there to perceive it, right? What about all those lakes out in nature that nobody's visiting right now? Do they exist? They're not being perceived by any humans, right? Do objects pop in and out of existence depending on whether or not they're perceived? You should be asking yourself that. Like, Barkley, how do you deal with this, right? Anybody here have a pet in their dorm room? A gerbil or a cat or something? Is anybody watching your pet? So on Barclay's view, do they exist? Do they just pop out of existence when you leave the room? Uh, I guess according to his view, yes. No one's watching. It seems like kind of a radical thing, right? That's a consequence of his view. It's okay though, because your pet still exists. And those Lakes out there in nature that no human's looking at, they still exist. They're still there. And everything outside of this room is still there, even though we're not looking at it. You want to know why? Barclay's got a great explanation for this. You don't have to worry about things popping in and out of existence if we're not looking at it. Because the big man exists. And the big man's watching over everything. God's presiding over everything. So even when you're not looking at your dog back home, God's still looking at your dog. And it still exists. You don't have to worry about Sparky disappearing. Yeah. I have an question. Okay, go for it. It it may have. Um I I think those quantum concepts have come out of just the strange, like, 
artifacts of experiments that we've done mostly. I don't know how much he was thinking about Barkley when he. Maybe. I don't know. Right. Until you open the box, right? And see. What's in the box? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so don't worry. Remember, he's a bishop. He thinks that God exists. God is watching over everything. And that brings us to our next point in Barclay's philosophy. Because Locke had this whole thing about describing to us what ideas are like, how ideas impact us, you know, what their nature is like, the different kinds of ideas. Well, in order to refute some of what Locke is getting at, Barclay has to kind of put forth his own analysis of ideas. Because remember, Locke said ideas come from objects, right? Ideas out there in the world, or uh, objects out there in the world cause us to have certain ideas. Well, Barclay doesn't think there are objects like that, right? So you might be wondering, where do ideas come from then? Because it's obvious, right? that we see red when we look at this, right? But if this is not an object existing independently of us, how do we get that idea in the first place? What's up with that? Well, it has something to do with Barclay's views on the nature of perception and on the existence of God, actually. Locke thinks that perception is kind of like a passive activity. We're just existing in the world and we're being flooded with perceptions from things outside of us. Stuff is just kind of happening to us, right? Colors and sounds and smells are just kind of coming to us from without. We're, and we're just kind of picking up everything. Barclay doesn't hold that same view of how perception works. Barclay, on the other hand, thinks that perception is actually something like an activity that we're doing. It's almost as if minds play some sort of formative role in constructing the reality that is around us. Here, we should say this too. Locke is going to say perception is passive and objects produce ideas in us. Barclay is going to say, no, nope, perception is active. So somehow the perception plays a role in constructing the reality that we live in. Which is an in interesting idea, right? But that if you think about it, Objects cannot produce ideas. Only consciousness or mind can produce an idea. Think about it. Can this table have an idea? Can this table form an idea? Then how the hell does something that is material cause something immaterial, an idea, to exist in our minds? That's what Barclay is thinking. He's like, that doesn't make any sense. Minds have ideas. Imagine, you know, a new mythological creature. There you are. Your consciousness produced an idea. Only minds and consciousnesses can produce or cause ideas. But he's not saying that we don't exist in a shared reality. Even though he thinks perception is active, he doesn't think that we are all existing in our own subjective reality. 
We exist in a shared reality. And in some sense, right, your mind constructs the reality that you experience. There are tons of examples of this, right? You walk into a room, depending on the expectations you have, that influences how your time in that room goes, right? If you're expecting people in that room to yell at you, you're going to have a bad experience in the room, right? You're just going to be waiting for it. But if you expect that the people are going to be friendly and nice when you walk into a room, your experience in the room, your reality of that room is going to be better, right? So there's a small role in which our consciousnesses play, uh, influence the reality that we experience. But we still all exist in a shared reality. Now you should be asking, if consciousnesses produce ideas, what exactly is determining the rules and the perceptions that we have in this shared reality? Right? Because when we all look at this, we all see a white piece of chalk. It's not like we all see something different, right? Or when we look at this shirt, we all see like a powder blue shirt, right? So we have the same perception. Why is that? Well, according to Barclay, God has set up this reality that we exist in, this mental reality, according to certain rules. You might say according to certain laws. The reason why we have the same perceptions when we look at things is because it's kind of baked into the reality that we have those perceptions. Our minds kind of all work in a similar way. Similarly enough that we see the same thing and we can communicate about it, right? So his answer kind of comes back to God. We see the same thing when we look at that table. We hear the same thing largely when we're at a Bon Jovi concert because God has baked into reality certain rules of perception. Does that make sense? So according to Barclay, it is, and he uses these words interchangeably, it is the spirit, mind, soul, or will which produces ideas, forms them, and alters them. And we can draw from this that our own individual consciousness, again, plays some sort of role in constructing the reality that we exist in. But behind our own individual consciousnesses and perceptions of the world, there is God who's kind of holding it all together. God who has created this world in a particular way with certain rules and laws baked into it. He is the ultimate cause of all ideas. You can imagine God as kind of like the cosmic switchboard for all the ideas that we have, the ideas that we're going to have, how ideas impact us. God is like underlying it all. And so you might say, if you wanted to get a little mystical and wooey, we all exist within the mind of God. That is the nature of our reality. God created all the ideas in the first place. God determines the perceptions that we have in some way. 
God established laws for how ideas are formed and perceived by us. These laws for how ideas influence us, for what we perceive, this is what he calls the laws of nature. The laws baked into the universe that determine our experience of it and what is. And so, do you remember what I said last time, what Kant's position was? He said there are the appearances of things, and then there are the things in themselves. The phenomena and the noumena. And one of the big problems in philosophy that has existed ever since that time has been, if we only have access to our perceptions, how the hell do we know what actually exists and what it's like? Right, because we can't get beyond our perceptions. How do we bridge this gap? Barclay is trying to bridge the gap in his philosophy. What he's saying is, there is no gap, because all that exists are perceptions and minds. That's it. You don't have to worry about figuring out what the objects are like in themselves, getting beyond your perceptions, because there are no such things. You just have your perceptions. Okay. So he tries to solve this problem but by denying the existence of objects independent of our own minds. And he recognizes the large role that consciousness plays in our understanding of reality and how reality is shaped. It's a pretty crazy view, right? Is anybody here like this view more than dualism? Are you still kind of hanging on to dualism a little bit? Descartes' view that there are minds and there are physical things. Is that more commonsensical to you? What do you think? Well, this is only one monistic view of the universe. Remember, monism, the idea that one substance or thing makes up everything in the universe. Barclay thinks it's the mind, or perception, or idea. That is the thing that makes up everything else. You can go the opposite way with it, which is what we've been talking about this whole class. And this is what your other reading had to do with. Rather than believing that everything is just mental stuff, you can believe in the contemporary scientific view of the universe. What we might call reductive naturalist materialism. This is kind of what our contemporary scientists believe the world is made up of. We can define each of these words. Materialism, does anybody remember the reading? What is that? Based on the reading, materialism <laughs> that I assigned you for today. What does materialism state? It's kind of right in the, the name. 
Right. And furthermore, that everything that exists is physical. It's made up of matter. That was weird. I don't know what that was. It's the view that everything that exists is made up of physical stuff, matter. Does anybody know what naturalism is? Again, it's it's right in the word. You don't have to think too hard about it. What word do you see in here? Nature. Nature. It's the view that everything that exists is natural. That is, it is a part of nature or it's a product of nature. In other words, there are no supernatural things. There are no gods, demons, spirits, angels, ghosts. Everything that exists is just natural, or is a, it's a product of nature. There are no supernatural things in the universe. Everything is natural. And finally, this word, reductive, this one's a little trickier. But it's the view that everything that we see around us can be explained by talking about biology chemistry and physics, neuroscience, all that stuff. So the feelings that you have, your hopes and dreams, hallucinations, everything in the universe can just be explained by talking about the underlying physics and chemistry of what's going on. That is, if we want to talk about love or get to the bottom of love, really we just need to describe how your brain is working appropriately, which neurons are firing, which electrical impulses are going off, so on and so forth. And so the contemporary scientific view offers us the following picture. The Big Bang created the universe. Life, at least on Earth, arose at some point in the deep past and evolved to what we see today. God doesn't exist, nor is God needed to explain how the universe works. This stuff isn't all minds and perceptions, it's atoms and molecules and energy. Star matter, right? That's like the contemporary scientific view. Anybody like that view? Yeah, it's kind of intuitive, right? And there's a lot of, we might say, evidence, centuries of evidence, right, to back it up. Yeah. In its essence, it denies the existence of the supernatural. It's evolutionary. It's based on cosmology. The cosmology that we've built up to this point. Does anybody see any weaknesses with this view. I suppose first we can talk about Barclay's view. One weakness, it seems batshit insane, right? 
it seems to contradict, uh, I don't know, our commonsensical notions of how reality works, right? Plus, he relies in his view on the existence of God. Maybe you don't think God exists. Maybe you think there are good arguments for why God doesn't really exist. Okay, so that's Berkeley's view. Well, there are issues with this view as well. If physics is determining everything, ultimately, how can we have any free will or control over our own lives? For example, the contemporary scientific view is going to tell us you're just made up of atoms and energy operating according to the natural laws of the universe. Right? How you feel, what you say, this is just stuff that your brain is kind of making you do based, of, based on how your brain is working. And we don't have any control right, over when neurotransmitters enter an ion channel right, or what chemistry is happening inside of our brain. So you might think this view kind of paints the whole universe as a bunch of little machines that are just operating, chugging along according to the laws of physics and chemistry. It seems like on this view, if you have some sort of robust idea of free will, that you actually have a choice in what you do, it seems like this view doesn't give us that. We might even say this view implies that you don't even really exist. We all take it for granted that we have a self, right? That we have an identity. But what does this view say? You're just a collection of atoms. What separates you ultimately from the table? Right? The table is also just a collection of atoms. Our atoms are arranged in a different way, but doesn't that imply that there really is no me if we're just atoms? Do atoms have a self? What makes a certain collection of atoms have a self and another collection not, right? And of course, the problem falls out of this. Can you be morally responsible for anything if you don't have free will? If the murderer had no choice over raping and killing those women, is he morally responsible for it? Let's imagine there was a device implanted in his brain that caused him to murder women. Is he responsible for doing that? I think our intuition says if you don't have any control over your actions, no, you, you're not morally responsible for them, right? Well, that's kind of the picture this view paints for us, is what we're doing, what we're thinking is just being determined for us by our brain, the chemistry and the physics, the neuroscience of our brain. We don't have any control over that, so therefore we don't have any control over what we do. So therefore, nobody's morally responsible for anything. But that doesn't really seem right, does it? We want to hold people morally responsible for things. Responsible. If you buy into this view too, you're probably also going to accept nothing exists for a reason or a purpose, right? If God didn't create the universe, then our existence is kind of just a cosmic accident, right? God didn't mold us in the womb because there is no God. We're just kind of here trying to figure shit out in a universe that doesn't care about us at all, right? And you might say that this view also makes it hard for us to argue that there is an objective right and wrong. Because what would such, such a standard, how could that exist in a natural universe? 
where there's just atoms and energy? An objective standard of right and wrong. What would be the basis for thinking that? So all the views that we're looking at have their own problems, have their own weaknesses. Descartes' view, dualism. How does a non-physical thing, a mind, and a physical thing interact? How does that fucking work? Right? Barclay's view seems crazy. <laughs> and it seems like he's making a logical leap when he says, we can't prove the existence of objects to no objects exist. Right? That's a leap. Maybe that leap is unfounded. And then there are problems that fall out of this view as well. What do you all think? What are you feeling? What are you thinking? You're going to talk about this stuff with your friends? <laughs> Scare them a little bit? Might be fun. Maybe I've scared you today. I don't know. Yeah? Maybe a little bit. Don't think too hard about it, OK? Go get a nutty pumpkin Dunkin' Donuts coffee or something. Any questions, comments? Otherwise, I'll let you go. OK, that covers Barkley. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you all have a great weekend. <laughs>